the recording now. And Bob, you want to introduce yourself and start your presentation. And give, while you're doing that, I'll uh, see if I can't manage to share my screen and show what we're talking about. It sounds good. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Bob Boheck. I'm currently uh, on the Jericho board, have been for a little over, the la uh, little over a year now. Um, but prior to that, I've had experience working with um, uh, St. Vincent de Paul uh, in several of their programs and a board member there in, in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, when I came, when my wife and I moved here to Central Oregon, uh, we started volunteering right away at St. Vincent de Paul here. One of the issues, uh, both through Jericho and St. Vincent de Paul, that we became involved with were the homeless individuals, particularly those who are chronically homeless, uh, living in the camps. Uh, been doing outreach to the camps now for at least five, probably six years. Um, one of our wrap-up sessions, we started discussing um, uh, the issue of enabling and helping and decided that what we really needed to be doing was working on a longer term, a better solution than just um, bringing out water, propane, clothing, food to the camps. So we started a, a group which has become the Redmond Village Outreach, Outreach Team. And uh, we're working on trying to establish uh, what I like to refer to as a tiny bedroom community uh, because this, the, the shelters that we have really are simply uh, bedrooms. And I'd like to take this opportunity today to kind of tell you where we're at, what we've developed and essentially what we need to proceed. Okay, next slide. I'm working on that here. Um, over the past, it's pretty close to four years now, there have been more than a dozen, probably more like 15 to 17 of us, not all at the same time, that have been working on this. We're all uh, uh, citizens here in, uh, in Central Oregon. Almost all of us live in Redmond and that we work one way or another, so many of us with the outreach program, but others that have been involved with housing issues, um, uh, Jericho Table, um, Ben Church, and other places. And our mission has been to, do, to get an organized effort to address the greatest needs that we've observed uh, while doing our, our outreach. Um, and one of those, of course, probably the, the most uh, immediate is safe and secure shelter. Um, something that will transition the individuals who wish to transition and not all of them do all of the time, but those that wish to transition from where they are, uh, as they th themselves say it, uh, living in the dirt, we say living out in the junipers to uh, some uh, more permanent housing. Uh, so we set ourselves up to um, explore uh, what was being done in other communities. And at that time, Opportunity Village was um, being opened in um, uh, Eugene. Since then, uh, there's been Hope Village and of course, several villages in the Portland area. So we semi became organized in about 2017, <laughs> wanted to take a look at uh, where, what services existed and what didn't. Um, and that's when we discovered uh, this concept of what was called tiny home or tiny houses. And as I said, I prefer tiny bedrooms. Uh, to, and that uh, this last oh, year and a half, it happened that um, Jericho Road uh, was uh, forming and doing, conducting a feasibility study uh, for services to the homeless. Uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, we've collected a fair amount of data and um, really have tried to pattern ourselves uh, uh, off of what has been provided and we believe successful in Eugene through Opportunity Village and in Medford through Hope Village. Although there are other ways of uh, dealing with houseless. In my mind, I see this as uh, a jigsaw puzzle, probably more like a 1500 size puzzle rather than a 200 size puzzle. And uh, the, a tiny bedroom community we believe is is one of the uh, one of the pieces that will uh, help the situation here in, in Central Oregon and give people a path. Um, again, those that desire it from where they are right now to uh, better and more permanent housing. So we we took a look at uh, uh, dealing with these individuals. What really were the needs? Um, what what was provided in the way of services and what was lacking? Um, uh, 
after a, a presentation by Dan Patrick from Opportunity Village Square One down in in uh, Eugene, uh, we got ourselves together and started collecting data, uh, initially primarily from Opportunity Village because they have an excellent online website um, that is open to anyone who is contributing to them. Um, and that's where things got started. They have what I consider still one of the best easy roadmaps to what to do if you would like to help with the houseless uh, individuals. And it's a kind of a 10 step process. These are not linear steps, but 10 things that need to be done. Starts with do some research and establish a group. And that's what we did. That's how we got started. Uh, it goes on with building political will, find a site, which is what we are currently working on, uh, plan and design a village. And that's one of the main topics that I'll be discussing uh, as we go through these slides. Uh, the individuals out there are everywhere from those that have jobs. Uh, there are, it's a, probably a small percentage, 10% or less. But uh, during our uh, point in time kind of counts, during the time that we do still traverse the uh, camps every once in a while, probably only two or three times a year, to, uh, primarily for the point in time, but also to see what the needs are. There are individuals who are out there who literally say, no, we don't need any help because I have a job, I can take care of myself, I just can't find a place to live. And that of course is, is one of the really serious unmet needs. Um, we have members of our, our community uh, during the point in time count uh, a year ago, that would have been uh, January of, of 2020, pre-COVID, um, we asked specifically, it wasn't a question that was needed on the form, but uh, we were um, very, Yes, I, I, you can go ahead, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen to, for a minute to let someone in. I can't find my cursor when I'm sharing my screen, so okay. I, I don't want to accidentally kick someone out. So <laughs> definitely not. Um, uh, the question that we asked was um, kind of where people came from, um, where they consider themselves residing before they became homeless. And it was a um, it was a surprise fully 80% of the individuals that we questioned and everybody that we questioned answered the question, said that they either have resided for a number of years or were born and raised in the central Oregon area, anywhere from, from Prineville to Terrebonne to Redmond, uh, a few in Bend. Um, but the large, very large majority of the individuals who are out there in the camp consider themselves residents of central Oregon for, the, for life that they have either come back here or they were raised here and um, they're here for a reason. There are individuals, we've met a few who uh, each fall get sick and tired of the rain on the west side and move over here so that uh, they certainly exist but they are not a predominant number in the camps. Um, all of the folks that are out there do share one thing in common um, and that is the need for safe and secure shelter. Um, what is most prominent in my mind, because it was shocking when it first occurred, um, when we were transitioning from a winter shelter at Highland Baptist to one that was essentially community-based, and uh, John and Kurt, if, if you've got any reminiscences of that, please share. Um, I felt at the time that that would be one of the best ways to get people during the most difficult time of the year, the winter, out of the camps and have something warm and safe. And uh, that didn't happen. Uh, it was rare to have an individual from the camps that would leave the camps, uh, come into one of the churches that, uh, that generously gave of their space for these individuals um, because it just, it wasn't, it wasn't practical because they would lose their belongings. The thievery out there um, is um, terrible. And so it would be generators, uh, it would be water containers, uh, it would be anything of value uh, that could go missing if somebody was not in the camp. So they either banded together, in which case maybe an individual or two would come in to the winter shelter, but largely they would not. Since that time, um, several years ago in our outreach, we've encountered many of the organizations represented here today. And uh, I can't say uh, 
any, more than just thank you. I mean, it really does take a village to help the individuals. And so we've worked, we have a, I, what I consider a very good working relationship with a number of the service providers and those who are also trying to assist those that are, that are homeless right now. Um, <clears throat> there are a few places in Redmond, a few. Um, uh, House for Hope has been open, but has been not very active the last year. Um, there are a couple of homes, as I understand it, that do house vets, but we're talking about the number of individuals that you can probably count on your hands. And the, um, the population of those who are out in the Junipers right now uh, is well over an order of magnitude larger than that. Um, talking with uh, the city police who are out there all too often, and from what we've seen in point in time counts, um, I would say currently that there's uh, probably 150 plus or minus 50, there could be more, and they're really scattered uh, everywhere from the transfer station down to the old rifle range along 126. And after you know, gathering this information, having these experiences, the, the really big gap is how do you get someone from living in the junipers, whether it's in a tent, an RV, or something in between, to stable uh, permanent housing? How do you get them off of drugs? Uh, how do you help with their mental illness? How do you get them back into, the, into what we call a community? Um, and so the, the gap that we've concentrated on is trying to uh, uh, build uh, one of the ways that that gap can be filled. Uh, transitional housing, safe and legal parking, which I hope we'll talk about today and certainly will be talked about next Tuesday. Um, for, for two reasons, uh, we've concentrated on safe, uh, a safe and secure village. One of them uh, is that the individuals who are out there are used to um, uh, some privacy. They're uh, used to not having a lot of folks around. Um, and the other is cost. Um, we've found, I've found, uh, looking at the data, that economically a village is probably the least expensive way to uh, build and, and operate stable, uh, stable housing and transition individuals. Uh, the startup costs at um, both Opportunity Village and uh, at Hope Village were between two and three hundred thousand dollars. That includes funds. That also includes in-kind donations. Um, and key to that is that both of those villages uh, were given uh, the opportunity to lease property. Opportunity Village it was an acre from the city, a very inexpensive lease, a dollar a year. And down in Medford, the first site that they looked at didn't pan out. So they have a combination of private property and city leased property. And both of them are roughly an acre in size. Um, a little bit larger is what we're looking at, an acre and a half to two acres. Because in, in Central Oregon in particular, a number of the individuals are housed in RVs or trailers. And as we've discovered again this last winter, uh, even, those, even though those may not be in the best of condition, uh, the individuals who live in them, uh, essentially, that's all they have. And it's very difficult to have them give them up. Uh, one couple, couple in particular uh, took essentially uh, two moves to get them out of the Junipers into secure parking in Bend this last winter. Uh, they simply would not give up their RV. I don't think any of us here would want to buy it or use it to camp in, but it's all they had. And the transitional part of transitional shelter is really critical here. It takes time for individuals who are used to living in the Junipers to um, be reintroduced into the society that you and I live in. Uh, organized, uh, living in a, a, a small and large community um, and having neighbors uh, next door uh, that you can trust. <laughs> Uh, it may sound uh, comical, but it, it's such a very serious situation out there. So that I don't, I don't have anybody with their hand raised, but I wonder if we might just take a break here. If anybody has a question or a comment they'd like to uh, chime in with, and let before we move on to the rest of the slides, Bill. 
Hey, um, sorry, I did. I was not able to attend the the uh, earlier video presentation about about the Hope Village in Medford. But um, what, uh, Bob, you were just talking a, a little bit about um, you know people who have uh, their own RV and also talking about this kind of um, tiny shelter concept. And so I'm, I was curious whether you're picturing blending those, uh, blending those things. So like a cluster of tiny homes and safe parking, or are those two things separate or, um, you know, what, what's, uh, you know, how are those things combined or, or, or separate? That um, it's an excellent question. And it's one that uh, we have, I would say struggled with uh, because both are needed here in Central Oregon. Um, right now, what we're envisioning is simply a tiny bedroom community stick built, not combining that with RVs, although that is needed. <clears throat> in my mind, there is no doubt that uh, uh, some type of secure safe parking is necessary because some of the RVs out there are in decent shape, they're runnable, they may not have current tags, but they're quite livable. But the village concept as uh, I, we wish to go forward with is really only envisioning um, tiny uh, wooden structures that, that I refer to as tiny bedrooms. Thank you. And um, you know, just, just to flag uh, an, another concept that's out there for uh, the Redmond community and, and uh, James and I have had some discussions about this. Um, there, uh, you, there has been a proposal and um, the board of commissioners is very seriously interested in considering uh, the idea of offering during the winter months, um, long-term space in the RV park out at the fairgrounds um, for uh, safe parking type, uh, type setup. I mean, it, it's not year round, uh, right. but it would be, um, you, you know, it would be a multiple month opportunity where people, you know, felt like they were, uh, authorized and, and, and welcomed to, to, to be there. Um, to me, that's very exciting because uh, two of the trailers that are out there at the fairgrounds right now have come, are occupied by individuals who have come from the camps this year. One of the difficulties, of course, is the 45 day limit. Um, and so that's been a workaround, but it would, it would be exciting. And I think uh, this next year, absolutely necessary um, not to have folks or at least as many parking on the streets uh, in whether it's uh, Redmond or Bend or Grindville or Terrebonne uh, to have that type of safe and secure parking available uh, for several months rather than just uh, several weeks at a time. I, that was one of the things I, I hope we will talk about later today and next, next Tuesday at the service providers meeting because I see that as a very viable and needed solution to, uh, to those who are, are in RVs and trailers. Great, thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you for laying out the situation for me. That's really helpful to understand. Yeah, and that's one of the one of the concepts that I wanted to talk about because I'm really uh, grateful that folks from Bethlehem Inn and Shepherd's House are here. I don't at all see this in, as an either or. This is an all and. Uh, different living styles, uh, different levels of need. Bethlehem Inn will be a high barrier shelter. I believe that's what Shepherd's House is envisioning here in Redmond, and that's certainly what we we are envisioning with the village would be a low barrier shelter uh, where there would be wraparound services. Some of the individuals might well go to um, drug and rehab treatment uh, and then come back to the village, or they might undergo that while they're in the village. Um, but the way that Shepherd's House runs the winter shelter right now is uh, really what we are thinking of modeling in terms of entry and behavior requirements while they would be in the village. No drugs would be allowed, um, uh, no alcohol uh, on, on site. Off site, they're adults uh, and they would conduct themselves uh, as they see fit. But when they come back to the village, it cannot be disruptive. And that is one of the ways that of course that they would be uh, removed from the village if their behavior becomes detrimental uh, to the village. So uh, what, what we're proposing, what we would like to see as a village is summed up um, in this screen. Um, if you'll allow me, my concept of a village is trying to create a home, but a home that is not under one roof. 
in a home, we typically expect a kitchen, a living room, a family room, some kind of common area where people can congregate, a dining room for meals, bathrooms, and a utility area. And in a village, this is achieved by having separate units. The individuals, uh, often called a tiny home, it's not, it's really just a bedroom, is their personal space for sleeping, for storage, and for being by themselves, having private space. And this would be a probably 90 to 120 square foot uh, facility. Uh, winters being what they are here, um, we're proposing heat. Um, most of the individuals in the camps right now that have uh, don't have functioning RVs, be they in tents or makeshift shelters, uh, use buddy heaters. Um, and this is another issue that we've debated, talked about, and right now feel that to be safe, to have a safe environment for these individuals, we would need electricity to each of the uh, tiny homes uh, so that there would be an electric panel, much like the um, uh, so-called pad structures, the white structures that you see uh, in many other places right now, they have a built-in electrical panel so that uh, which uh, heats the place. The difficulty with those is they are not well insulated and I don't think they would be suitable for uh, winter here in central Oregon. But we would like to have uh, uh, electricity as a heat source. Then also, of course, that can be used for charging phones, which is one of the issues, of course, is the individuals often need help in, in securing a phone uh, and light. Um, other structures, uh, because of necessity, because these villages are built on leased land, uh, uh, they typically have to have uh, these tiny bedrooms mobile as well as, so a mobile uh, kitchen, not unlike what we see on the streets of most cities nowadays, but a place to prepare food. Uh, they'd also have um, a common space uh, at Opportunity Village uh, and possibly ours that would be in the, in the form of a yurt, uh, some place where individuals would be able to be indoors, uh, say have Wi-Fi, uh, have lounges, computers, um, place for sitting, relaxing, reading, uh, taking care of <laughs> filling out paperwork they would need. And then also another uh, uh, structure uh, the, that serves as a dining room, uh, probably a double wide or some type of mobile trailer unit. Um, and this down at um, down in Medford at Hope Village, uh, this is the structure where they keep their refrigerators. The refrigerator is is uh, shared by uh, two uh, uh, of the uh, tiny um, tiny bedrooms. They currently have 34 uh, bedroom units, so they have 17 refrigerators lined up on a wall. Um, and so it serves as a dining area as well as uh, makeshift partial kitchen. Then of course necessary would be uh, what we would call a bathroom, have toilets and showers, but it would be on wheels so that if necessary, it could be moved. If, if the land is not leased, a lot of these structures could be on uh, concrete slab foundation. And lastly, but also very important would be a utility area. So there would be uh, laundries, uh, probably as they have in Medford, a small building where they're, uh, it's right next to the entry gate. So the person mon uh, uh, monitoring entry, which is uh, limited uh, only to residents and, and guests um, would, um, would have a warm place to stay. Um, and then the mailboxes are right outside. And we hadn't really thought about mailboxes until we visited uh, Hope uh, down in Medford. But thinking about it, it's almost absolutely necessary um, to get identification. It has to be sent somewhere. To apply for a job, you have to have an address. And so mailboxes are, are really one of the small features, but very important features that allow these people to feel that they are indeed transitioning back into society. One of the Major issues, uh, major criteria is we have to have a place to build the village. And we have been working with the city, with Rebecca and Sean Cook, at identifying properties that are city owned that would be uh, feasible. And we wanted uh, the two criteria that Doug and I have looked at primarily are, uh, are is it near utilities? So we don't have a major ex expense getting sewer, water, electricity to it. Uh, and is it in a location where the individuals in the village can access businesses and services if they need to do so in person. 
So very definitely uh, within the UGB and preferably within the, the city limits. Uh, we've identified two sites, one of which we think of as near ideal. Um, the difficulty is it's uh, city owned. However, it's in the airport addition and therefore has uh, rules uh, it has to conform to FAA conditions. And um, I, I have no doubt that we could conform to that, but it all, that also carries a price tag now, which is $8,000 per year per acre. And that's one of the reasons we're looking at another site, uh, which is slightly less than an acre, not nearly as desirable. Um, between the canal, the literal canal, it's along Canal Boulevard and Highway 97, uh, in close proximity to the uh, uh, hospital. So uh, safe and secure locations. Uh, my personal belief is that in order to achieve that in Redmond for a first structure uh, of this kind, it needs to be outside of any residential areas, although the one in Medford is fairly close to homes and it's also in the industrial area, but there will, there will be a kickback. Uh, there will be the so-called NIMBY effect and the fewer people that uh, reside near this that, that feel somewhat insecure, have anxieties about such a, a, a shelter, um, I think needs to be minimized until here in Redmond, we have, uh, have uh, one up and operating to see that they're actually beneficial to the community, not detrimental. But uh, our goals are uh, to provide a safe, secure location within Redmond uh, that, is conducive to people transitioning from uh, being in the junipers, uh, having what I would call less than desirable living conditions uh, into uh, uh, more uh, stable living environment and back into uh, kind of our community at large, being productive members. Right. Are there yeah. comments or questions? I have a question, Bob. In, in terms of the, the, the people who uh, sleep in their cars on the street, get up in the morning and go to a job, uh, find a place to park on the street again, has there been any thought the, the village might accommodate those folks? Yes. Yeah, this would be one of the populations that would be, in a sense, most easily accommodated and, uh, and helped by this. Uh, even the individuals in the camps who have jobs, live in a trailer, um, they, of course, parked illegally according to the law and being in a village like this would uh, at least uh, eliminate that anxiety of whether they would have that uh, for any any time in the future until they have enough uh, security deposits etc cetera, etc cetera, amassed so that they can find and afford uh, a place to rent or to have a mortgage here in town yeah the the targeted individuals um, uh, of course, what we work with with outreach are the chronically homeless, but there are other individuals, those that are coming out of prison, uh, currently don't have a place. Uh, I came across one uh, this winter and uh, being part of outreach, you know, he needed a tent, he needed uh, a heater um, and all I could offer because we don't have uh, any shelter here in, in Redmond is, you know, there's a place in the camps and he says, I'm not going anywhere near him. There's too many too much drugs out there and I don't wanna become involved with that. So having a shelter like this would be the precise place that this individual could go. So Bob, am I on about the right slide? Yes. Yeah, yeah getting near the end. Um, the questions about uh, this provide access to social services is kind of the last thing that I wanted to comment on. Um, one of the gratifying aspects this last year of doing outreach is the number of other agencies that have joined us out on East Antler um, to help. Uh, and the, the list of services is a long one um, from providing IDs, getting driver's license, birth certificates, uh, healthcare, Mosaic Medical has their van out there almost every Friday. Uh, we have a shower truck. Uh, that's why a shower and toilet uh, vehicle in the village is so important. It is one of the most desired aspects of the social services that, that are provided out there. Um, but 
working with, with people, uh, uh, having a case manager is an integral part of the village so that we can work with them in terms of job searching. Uh, if, if they're parents, we would like to find a way that we could actually house families up uh, in there. I don't know that that's where we would start, but it is one of the things that we would like to do. So parenting skills, having, having an easier time to access uh, uh, mental health assistance, uh, drug, alcohol treatment, uh, applications for SSI, Social Security, getting a phone and keeping a phone, uh, having an address. Um, all of these are an important part uh, of, of having a village with wraparound services. And then um, part of the funding comes from the individuals there. Uh, the, the Hope Village model, they charge everyone now, uh, the first month they're there because it's kind of on a trial basis, uh, about a hundred, I think they're, they started at $85. It's, it's a hundred or 125 now. And then if they, if a person stays, they pay for the program. There's not a rental agreement, uh, but they pay for the program. And much of the money above that initial goes into a savings account. So the individuals, one, learn how to save, two, have enough money when they're ready to transition out of the village uh, to pay a, a security deposit first and last month's rent around here, that can run into thousands of dollars. So uh, much of the money collected goes back to the individual uh, at the end of their stay in the village. Bob, can I ask a question? Yeah, Rick. I was curious about the, the funding, you know, sustainable funding for this. Uh, is there a number you anticipate? It doesn't sound like you know $85 a month. That it's probably self-sustaining. No, uh, for the ongoing budget, uh, in my mind, and this is part of the discussion we need to have with the uh, agencies as well as granting. Uh, probably about a 25, 25, 25, 25 split. I would would like to see the county and the city contributing about 25% of the ongoing we would raise the, the other funds through uh, donors and cash donations from individuals. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we're gonna need an online presence uh, to be able to meet that. Um, uh, the ongoing expense for uh, Hope Village is somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to $20,000 a month. So, um, you know, uh, we're talking four to $6,000 uh, from the city, uh, four to $6,000 from the county is what I'm shooting for, but th we haven't even begun those discussions, but. That's what I have in my mind. Uh, the justification is, and one of the reasons that um, I really like what they've done in Medford is that the police there play an integral role in, in helping the village. There is a, a sergeant who serves on the board uh, at Rogue Retreat and the, uh, uh, the city uh, was so pleased with what happened uh, last summer with the wildfires, they approached Rogue Retreat to open up an urban campground to get people off of the river where the wildfires eventually did hit. Uh, so some funding, I, I think, it, I, in my mind, is uh, to be expected from the, the city and the county, simply based on the reduced cost for law enforcement, as well as, uh, I have to reiterate, some of these individuals are currently working and do pay taxes, and almost all of them have over the years uh, had paying jobs, so that they have contributed some of them are approaching or on Social Security or SSI. So I, I think it has to be a, a shared expense. Can, can I follow up just to, clear, to clarify? Yes. Uh, Fifteen to $20,000 a month. Um, and you anticipate that serves about how many people? We're looking to start the village at probably about 10 units and building up to, and it depends on the amount of land we have, but somewhere in the vicinity of 30 to 35, I would say. Uh, I don't, and it's going to, depend, it's going to be dependent on the funding. It's going to be dependent on the size of the land and also on what we can do in terms of uh, having wraparound services, what's a, a reasonable number to take uh, to, uh, to be able to uh, work with. But 30 seems to be a number that most of the villages uh, kind of top out. 30 tiny bedrooms, uh, 40 to 50 individuals, actually, because there are couples. When we were down at Hope Village last October, they had 30 um, what I call bedrooms occupied. They were hoping to get two more on site, and they had 39 individuals in the village. Any other any comments, questions? 
Phil? Um, Bob, I just also wanted to offer that uh, the county is currently trying to put together a, a map and inventory of properties that we own uh, within and very near to the city of Redmond and the city of Bend. Um, and there are, I, I was just taking a quick look, um, there are some, some uh, substantial sized uh, county, uh, uh, that the county has a massive amount of land on the east side of Redmond. Yes. Um, but there's also a couple of pieces that, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm seeing one, one piece, and I don't know what the, you know, what the status of these pieces of land are, what we're using them for currently, but there's like a, an eight acre piece, uh, a little bit east of, uh, or sorry, a little bit west of Sage Elementary School. And there's a couple of acre piece, um, just a little bit north of the Opportunity Foundation of Evergreen, um, that uh, you know, those are those are jumping out at me as uh, vacant, you know, currently vacant county-owned properties within the city um, that might be in areas that uh, you know that, that they wouldn't cause too much um, disturbance of of um, residential uh, you know, residential areas. Uh, or, you know, like with that eight acre, eight acre piece, it's big enough that you could sort of, you could really, you could buffer, you yes. could buffer, uh, buffer any neighbors from, uh, you know, from disturbance. I, so, we live only about three blocks from Sage. I'm, I know west of Sage is the cemetery. I don't, I'm not sure what other, what would be county owned uh, going I'm, up that I'm, hill. Most of that is housing now. The, yeah, uh, I mean. There's the cemetery, then you cross 31st, and there's this, I mean, just, just from the, 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 the satellite imagery, it looks like a big open dirt patch or like maybe a mining site. I mean, there's a whole bunch of red, red earth showing. Uh, but uh, yeah, west side, of, um, west side of Southwest 31st Street. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, there's a lot of residential around there. And that's one of the reasons that uh, that was one of the pieces that I believe uh, it's one of the pieces we initially considered, but because of its proximity to the residential area, we kind of ruled it out. Um, the other off of 126, we looked at a piece up there, but it is not um, uh, adjacent to the utilities, um, at least the city owned property that the, the um, County owned property there, I'd have to take another look, but uh, access to utilities is a major issue in that area. Yeah, the, the, the piece that I'm seeing is, um, it's literally just north of the Opportunity Foundation, about you know, maybe a quarter of a mile, uh, less, than, you know, less than a quarter of a mile. Um, is that, that might be the old mill, the, um, has a lot of lumber or at least wood stacked on it. Um, if it's south of uh, Ninth, or I'm sorry, west of Ninth, that that could be the will, the mill. Yeah, we we can we can we can kind of poke around in this later when you guys I get the inventory. But, I, but the, 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 I guess the key thing is that um, the county may own own may own land that may be of interest for this kind of long term lease uh, type type arrangement or or um, or a contribution. And, and um, in a, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, that there, there, there are some, the county also has, uh, is going to have access to some American Rescue Plan uh, dollars in the, in the near term. So in a lot of ways, it, it might be easier to, um, or it, it might be a, a smoother, easier request to, um, to uh, pitch us on offering land and construction costs, you know, first costs rather than asking us for annual, um, you know, annual support. Or I guess, you know, maybe, you know, if it was, if it ended up being a, a county property, then, um, then, you know, uh, the, 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 the offer of the land could be, you know, part of our annual support. Uh, that's terrific for me to hear. Thank you. We right. definitely I, I'm, I'm only one of three commissioners, but that, that, that's the way I see it. I, well, we'll just sign I, it I, over. To have that opportunity to explore that would be terrific. Um, this seems like an opportunity to mention that uh, May 11th at six o'clock, the uh, county and the city, the county commission 
and the city, Redmond City Council have a joint meeting and uh, homelessness is a major topic during that meeting. There's gonna be presentations from a number of people and, and a bit of a panel discussion, I believe. So uh, if you go to the city website and assume the county website, you can learn how to log in to watch that. Um, I saw Rob had unmuted himself. Do you have a question, Rob? Oh, <clears throat> I was just going to ask him about the uh, time frame. Uh, what do you like the safe parking? I mean, that's a relatively easy project. I mean, you're not talking about digging up utilities and, and whatnot. Uh, is there any idea of a time frame of when we could participate maybe with the city and in, a, in a, a safe parking area? Because we could use that uh, yesterday. Yes, and it's going to be needed, I think, over the next six months uh, greatly. Uh, I was really excited to, to hear Phil talk about the possibility of the RV park, trailer park out by the uh, fairgrounds, because uh, that would be a great way to get through the winter. Um, next Tuesday, I know there'll be uh, more opportunity to talk about safe parking. There has been safe parking, very limited, but safe parking in Bend this last winter. And uh, I hope that will be an option that is seriously considered here in Redmond. Uh, I think liability concerns are, are going to have to be addressed and possible sites, but um, there is already a site um, near the highway that is nothing but gravel that would be really easy to park RVs on. And it's owned by the city? It's owned by the city, yes. And at our Redmond service provider meeting, which is also on May 11th uh, at 1030, uh, Stacy Witte, who... Uh, is the founder of REACH uh, Central Oregon is going to be there to, and she ran the safe parking program in Bend. So she's going to be there to answer questions and give us some information about that. And we have already shared with the city information about Bend's program over the winter uh, in hopes that uh, maybe we can get uh, whatever is needed to bring something like that to Redmond, to Redmond. So May 11th is a big day for us. Don? I have a question in regards to uh, the availability and the sustainability question. Um, we all know that Bethlehem Inn is moving into the neighborhood and we know uh, basically the demographic that they will be serving. I haven't heard very much as far as updates on um, Shepherd's House um, efforts I know that there have been ongoing uh, efforts on their behalf to find a space. <clears throat> I'm just wondering if anybody can give us an update on where, where they are in their negotiations and their search for a shelter uh, location and uh, whether or not those demographics are going to be any different from what uh, Bob and his group are talking about. Yeah, so we did a... Uh... We signed a lease to own um, and we're in the process, just the preliminary processes now with the city of Redmond to begin working on a CUP. Um, that uh, site used to be what was the Grace Gate Church. For some of us, at a, I live in Redmond for lots of years. So some of us remember it as the Coyote uh, <laughs> Ranch. Um, so <laughs> no, it was a, was a restaurant. Right. Yeah, it was a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think before that, it was like a, a, a garage, I, if I remember, because I've, mm -hmm. I've been around the community, living in the community for a long, long time. So anyways, it's gone through a lot of, of transitions. But um, so that's where it is at with us right now. We're, that just actually transpired. I mean, we were kind of in a tough spot where we couldn't say a whole lot initially because as we were working through the negotiation, we weren't certain it was actually going to happen or not until it just did it just a little over a week or two, a couple of weeks ago now. Well, congratulations on that. Uh, are you thinking about, or do you have any idea of what the capacity might be? Yeah. So we're going to, um, I think we all know, you know, we've been running the cold weather shelter now for six, seven years. And one of the real challenges to that has been 
you know, you build the relationships through those winter months and then you have to say goodbye and then you have to reconstitute those relationships again in the fall. And a lot of things happen between spring and fall with our people that we care for. So we're really, you know, we're going to be targeting again that community um, will be, you know, low barrier and in the sense that, you know, we know that really the niche that Shepherd's House serves is the people that are really wrestling, struggling through, you know, addictions, mental health issues, um, those kind of things. And so we'll have, we've got uh, our builders in there working through estimates right now. Um, but the goal will be to have space for men and also to have space for women, but also we'll create some space. So we'll have options for at least a couple of families as well. Um, and our, 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 intent there too will be that they'll have a much longer stay with us as long as they're able to live safely within the community and, and the guidelines that you know we we have for our sheltering um, we're also going to be working with the builders to put in some longer term uh, dorms and what we're going to be doing there is uh, hopefully is to be able to have some of our later staged program people, because we also run long-term programs for men, women, and children. Um, some of our folks, specifically in our men's program, um, have some real interest in learning how to shelter and to be a part of kind of solutions from where they've come from. So some of our later stage program people, we have a six, six phase program for our, our folks. Uh, we'll have some um, dorm room bed hopefully created there so they can work alongside of us and the staff that will be part of that. We'll have case management and those kind of things working in the shelter side. So offering classes and opportunities for people to, to kind of hopefully move into some types of solutions of transitional living. And I think I could see some of those folks, hopefully maybe being able to partner, you know, with you all in this kind of a project where they might want some kind of a longer term solution to their living. Right. And, I could see maybe um, some of those folks wanting to hopefully tie into the the, uh, the small bedroom community. Um, so I, let me ask you real quick: um, Do you have a timeline in mind? Do you have any idea when you might be opening the doors? Yeah. So yeah, no, I do not right now, Don, because we have a lot of work to do in the building. We've got to, um, you know, a number of things. One, we've got to be able to get it. Um, to be livable in the sense of we have to have uh, sprinkler systems put in place. We've got to really reconstitute the whole kitchen. Um, the bones of the kitchen is there, but there's a lot of things that are missing and have been neglected. They haven't used it over the years. So we've got a lot. I would say right now our plan is that we're going to need to continue to partner with the churches that we partner with for this winter. Um, will probably be, my suspicions are, we'll be in construction during the fall winter. My hope would be, love to see us be able to have it opened up somewhere in the springtime of next year. I don't think that's uh, um, too pie in the sky, but I also know it's not easy getting builders pinned down. But so also, as far as your operating expenses are concerned, Bob mentioned earlier with, with, with his concept He's looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 15000 a month to be able to operate. Um, I imagine you folks have already got a working budget and, uh, you know, a business model already in place. But uh, what kind of comparable numbers will you need in order to be sustainable? Yeah, I'd have to have, like, John Ryan's my numbers guy. So he's my well, director of more than a million dollars a year? Or... I don't know. Right off the top of my head. I don't know. I can't give you that firmly. Yeah. yeah, no, I don't think it's going to be that. But I mean, we've got a lot of work to do in the building. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of construction that's going to have to be done to, to make that habitable. Obviously, the big piece for us is going to be getting the CUP. And so the CUP in that process, and we're just beginning that process with the city and with our architect, oh. and with our builder. Um, so we're coming right... We're coming up on 11 o'clock. Um, we can, the meeting can go over, but I just want to respect people's time that have to leave at 11. Uh, and I don't want to put you on the spot, Dana, but I'm going to do it anyhow. I mean, as the, the person here who has some 
uh, experience running a facility like this and managing it. Do you have some, some comments to share? Um, I feel like I need some more framework uh, <laughs> to answer that question. That's totally fair. <laughs> Um, do, do you want to ask something more specific or, um, I mean, uh, Bob and I talked earlier today and, um, I think like right now that he's really good with his focus of acquiring land before you kind of like do anything before, um, cause he used to ask me to write the program like three years ago and I was like, we don't quite need that yet, you know, um, uh, I can just say in my experience of uh, the village, it's it's an amazing um, uh, opportunity for the people who stay there to feel empowered. Um, having a council uh, made up of peers that live there is super great and having their input on all sorts of things, including like programmatic changes and stuff. Um, I, uh, was telling Bob the importance of, of warmth. Um, the Kenton Women Village was super cool because uh, architect students from PSU were involved in the building of the pods, which is what we called them. Um, because if you call them houses, uh, there's certain uh, eviction things that come into play. So we called them pods because it was a program. Um, and they were all in theory supposed to maintain a certain amount of heat by the body heat and it just wasn't really a thing. Um, and so the importance of heat and power is, is, is uh, great. Um, and thinking about water and uh, kitchens and um, hygiene bathroom sources. Um, which don't always have to be plumbed. Like we had a mobile kitchen that was in a truck trailer that was like built into it. And we had a shower and bathrooms that were in a truck ta trailer along with um, uh, porta potties um, at the first location. The second location um, is some somewhat different. Um, yeah, I don't know. Without really being prompted with what you're looking for, those are just some things I think of. Actually, that was... Uh, kind of along the line of what I was thinking about. And uh, I mean, was Kenyon Village transitional? Uh, yeah, definitely. And it was cool because I had a co-manager and we were both um, kind of program managers, but we also did case management. Um, and so, you know, there were goals that were set um, and we would ha try to have metrics of success by certain dates. And, you know, you were only guaranteed um, a spot in the village at, to a certain point. And unless you were showing some sort of progress, obviously that progress can, you know, be somewhat flexible, but just showing that, that they were working towards independence and transition. And I also just want to say, um, like the community loved us. We were involved in the neighborhood coalition or neighborhood I guess it's called coal, the name, the, you know, Kenton, the Kenton village neighborhood, co whatever group. Um, and we were involved in the local community garden and we regularly did like garbage cleanup and participated in the Kenton farmer's market. We grew our own food on site. And so some of the ladies would go sell that at the farmer's market. And then also um, there was like this guy that was kind of like um, independently wealthy. He was retired and he had started this program where he would provide people of lower income um, a commercial grade uh, sewing machine, old billboards and like everything you could need to either make his design of a bag and he would buy it from you at a per piece um, uh, amount or you could use the supplies he gave you and make your own design and sell it at whatever price you wanted to and become like your own entrepreneur. So that was super cool to have like a social enterprise piece. Um, yeah. Thank you. That that's what I wanted to hear about. I appreciate it. I mean, and it sounds like so much of this is things that we take for granted in our everyday lives, allowing people who are living out in the Junipers, as Bob said, to, to uh, have the opportunity to have those very basic things and really establish a community. So any other questions for Bob? Or you have some more comments, Bob? 
No, I'm just, I'm really excited to hear the, the comments and the input that we've gotten today. Um, I, I really look forward to bringing this project to fruition. And it's, uh, you know, the saying at Opportunity Village is, it takes a village to create a village. And that is absolutely on the mark. Um, we'll bring more people into it. I really do hope to see the village up and operating in about 12 months. That will be dependent on finding land and then of course raising the funds. 